Again, thank you very much, Denis and, and Nature Vancouver for uh, welcoming me tonight. Uh, before I, I start this presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the Lingwangwen speaking people on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands today, as well as the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Sanish people who continue to maintain a traditional relationship um, with this land. I'd also like to acknowledge that a lot of the images that I'll be showing today and the collections that I'll be talking about um, are a product of colonialism. And as such, they only show a specific view of the landscape because these images were taken for a particular purpose. And so that's really important to acknowledge because when we look at these images and we try to analyze them, we're looking at them for a very specific and very unique um, perspective. So to begin, I'd like to start with a quote by famous author J. Bay McKinnon. And he says that the history of nature tells us we have been part of a great forgetting and we can now be part of the reminding. So I think that this quote is very appropriate to the field of repeat photography because repeat photography uh, helps us look into our past, our common human past, and helps us reflect on um, where we were, how far we've come today, and perhaps point us in directions of our futures, of potential different futures. So today's presentation, as uh, Denny mentioned, so it focuses on repeat photography. So first I'll begin by just providing a brief uh, definition of the, the practice as well as a brief history. And then I'm gonna start describing three different projects that have used this technique uh, for various outcomes, mostly ecological, but I'll also cover a project that looked at more of a cultural aspect of, uh, of uh, repeat photography. And then I'll finish with uh, the Mountain Legacy Project, which is a project that uh, I'm involved in as part of my uh, PhD research. So to begin, well, what is repeat photography? Um, it's the practice of taking multiple photographs of the same subject from the same place, but at different points in time. And so it's basically a way to use photography as a way to document change. And this change could be ecological, but it can also be uh, cultural. The first use of repeat photography um, is known to be around the late uh, 19th century. And it was by a Bavarian mathematician um, of the name of Sebastian Findeswalder. And so he was noticing that a lot of the glaciers in his uh, neighboring Alps were starting to change. And so he wanted to have a way to document uh, the changes that he was observing. And so what he did is that he went to uh, these glaciers and set up multiple photo stations on different parts of those glaciers, took photos, and then a couple of years later came back and repeated uh, those same photos from those same locations. And then by having the original photograph and the subsequent photographs, he was able to compare and contrast change and start analyzing the changes that were going on um, within these glaciers. In North America, the first use of scientific photography began uh, with the expansion of the railway system and roads. So as cities were expanding west and people began to move further and further west, surveyors were taking photographs in order to document the different places that they were going through and the different places that they were surveying for uh, railway placement and for road placement. And so prior to the use of photography, these survey parties actually had traveling artists with them in order to be able to do um, the same type of, uh, of job. So a lot of the uh, photo collections that we have in the Mountain Legacy Project and the ones that I'm gonna talk about, the other two projects actually come from this uh, surveying work as North America was expanding further and further west. And take some water. <laughs> so the basics of repeat photography. What do you need to have successful repeat photography? Well, first of all, you need to have some historical images that you're going to repeat or that you want to repeat. And you really have to be clear in your goals of why you're repeating those images. So it has to have a purpose, a clear goal. And once you've identified those images, well, you actually have to acquire them. And so that means maybe doing research in the archives, in the libraries, maybe researching personal collections. It also means contacting the different bodies or repositories that are hosting these images. So asking permission to be able to use these images, paying associated fees, um, basically anything that's required in order for you to be able to use these photos as part of your repeat photography exercise. 
once you have the images and you have permission uh, to use them, you actually have to find out where they were taken from. And so if you're lucky and there's information on the photo, maybe there's a label that can specifically say which location it was, maybe there's a diary associated with it, or maybe in the archives or specific notes that uh, describe the location of these photos, then that's great. But oftentimes it's sort of like a treasure hunt. And so you have to bring in different sources of information. Sometimes you even have to do some virtual traveling. So uh, in the Mount Legacy Project, we do a lot of what we like to call Google Earth virtual travel. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but basically use all the means at your disposition in order to be able to find uh, the locations of these historical photographs. Once you think you have a pretty good idea where they are, or at least you hope so, then comes the fun part of actually going out there and um, repeating these photos. And so depending on the nature of these photos, so if they're taken in cities or urban areas, it might be a little bit more easier to access and to, to go to these places that these photos were taken. But if it's like the Mountain Legacy Project and you know there are mountain peaks in very remote areas, then it might require a little bit more work to, to get you to those places. Once you are at the spot, um, then comes the fun part of actually aligning your um, historical image with your modern view. And so the picture here on the right is a picture from the 2019 field season. And we have two field crew members that are doing exactly that. And so on the right hand side, we have the historical image. So that's uh, Cassandra's pointing at uh, this historical image. And Charles on the left hand side is basically trying to replicate the same field of view. So the field of view of the image is basically the extent of that image. So you wanna be able to capture the same extent in your modern repeat as you are um, in your historical photograph. You then have to be able to align your historical photograph with your modern view. And so there's different techniques to do this and I'll talk a little bit about them um, in a few mi minutes. But just to, to summarize in the Mountain Legacy Project, we have a grid over a photograph and that allows us to center our images. And then we match the grid on our camera to the grid um, onto our historical photo. If you're satisfied with the alignment, satisfied with the field of view, then you click <laughs> that last little bit there and you take your photograph. So you've repeated your image. And then comes the fun part of actually analyzing the image afterwards. And there's lots of software programs that will allow you to do that. And I'll talk a little bit about what we use um, at the Mountain Legacy Project to analyze the change that we see between our historical image and our modern image. So in terms of products that you obtain or different techniques, you might be tempted to think, well, you know, why not use modern uh, products such as aerial photography or satellite imagery? Um, and it's true, both techniques you know, involve the analysis of images in order to be able to have a record and measure change. And that change can be, again, ecological um, across a specific time period. However, depending on your research objectives, one technique might be better for you than the other. So just to differentiate these, these two techniques, so for repeat photography, we're talking about images that are taken from an oblique view. So that's the human eye viewpoint. So what we see with our human eye is what we see in the image. For aerial photography or satellite imagery, we're talking about a top-down view, so sort of a bird's eye view. So we're seeing the landscape from a completely different perspective, and that's gonna have a completely different uh, research outcome. In terms of spatial scale, repeat photography tends to have a little bit more of an increased detail because you're focusing on a smaller portion of the landscape. Whereas for aerial photography, you're often dealing with larger areas, so you have less site-specific detail. Where it becomes interesting is the temporal depth. So for repeat photography, you can actually go back as far in time as when you know, the first photographs uh, were taken, so when the first cameras started to appear. So that could be you know, 1850, so you can go back 150, 160 years ago. Whereas for aerial photography, you're kind of limited to the products that were produced recently because aerial photography only started be, being popularized in the 1920s, 1930s. Satellite imagery started being used in 1960s, 1970s. So you're definitely more restrained into how far back in time um, you can go to use these specific products. 
Finally, in terms of comparing images, so in repeat photography, we tend to deal often with one image pair. Sometimes we do a three-peat, but the amount of effort and resources it takes to find the images and go back to those places uh, means that you won't be dealing with many, many uh, image pair comparisons. Whereas earlier photography, um, you often deal with multiple images, multiple sets of images across multiple uh, timestamps. So again, both of these techniques are very useful. They're both using images in order to analyze change, but depending on different research goals, one technique might be more appropriate uh, than another. So I'm gonna talk about, first talking about the first project, but I'm just gonna exit here and just see if there's any questions, because I don't think I could see uh, the questions on my, um, on my screen. Or actually, maybe what I'll do is I'll go back to play and maybe I'll have Denis um, read some questions if there are any. Any questions so far, Denis? There's no questions so far. No. Okay, perfect. We'll do that for, uh, for the following uh, changes, for the following um, different projects, if there are any questions. So the first project that I'd like to talk to you about that has used uh, repeat photography to analyze ecological change is called the Changing Mile. Uh, some of you might have heard about this project. It's a pretty well-known sort of benchmark study in Eco um, ecological sciences and plant studies. And so the project creators were uh, professors in um, Arizona. So Robert Turner, um, Webb, uh, Jim Bowers, and I think James Hasting. And they um, were observing a lot of changes in their surrounding environment. So they had come across this collection of historical survey photographs from um, the 19th century. And so they were comparing what they were seeing in these photographs with what they were seeing in their surrounding environment. And they were noticing a lot of change in a seemingly changes place. So when we think of the desert, we don't necessarily think of it as a place that changes a lot, but they were noticing a lot of changes, a lot of invasive species, in particular uh, mesquite. And so they decided they were gonna repeat these photographs in order to be able to capture and analyze um, this change. And so the original photos that they were dealing with were taken from 1890 to 1915. And they went and repeated these photographs uh, between 1960 and 1962. So they repeated them once. And then 30 years later, they came back and repeated them again. So they actually have three sets, well, I guess two sets of repeats for one original photograph. And so initially they were dealing with 100 pair of images that they had repeated. And then when it came back 30 years later, they added 200 more uh, to their collection. And the output of that was two books and lots of research papers, but two pretty well-known books. The first one being The Changing Mile and the second one, The Changing Mile Revisited. So in terms of location, so as I had mentioned before, they focus mostly in the southwestern United States. So parts of uh, California, New Mexico, Arizona, and also a little bit into Mexico. The camera stations, so those are the locations where the original photos were taken. They were located anywhere from uh, sea level all the way up to one vertical mile, hence the title of the book, The Changing Mile. So they ended up having 300 sets of matched photos from 260 different camera locations all throughout this region. Um, as I had mentioned before, the original photos that they had used in order to be able to complete this project were taken by, were taken by surveyors that had used uh, these photos in order to document uh, land claims, different road and rail locations, so particularly for uh, map making. And so the way that they interpreted this change, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes, is they looked at plant cover change using uh, field notes and labels for a species ID. So they actually individually labeled each species that they were seeing in the historical photos and then in the repeat, and they looked to see if their cover had increased, decreased, or remained the same. Let's just look at some images and see, see how, uh, how they were observing change. So on the left hand side here is the original image and taken in 1889. So you can see it's pretty dry, uh, pretty arid, not a lot of plants. You can still see the road pretty clearly. Now on the top right image, so that's the first, um, the first image right here, you can still see the road, 
but you can definitely see some encroachment coming in from the right hand side, a little bit of mesquite kind of in the mid foreground there. And then by the time that they took the second repeat in 1994, everything's completely covered, completely encroached. You can't see the road. Uh, you wouldn't even be able to tell that there was a road um, by that point in time. So quite, quite uh, a lot of change in the last uh, 100 years between the original photograph and the, the second repeat. Here's another uh, sets of photos from this project. So looking at the historical image in 1911, so we're looking at uh, the Santa Rita Mountains. So you can see in the foreground, it's sort of like a grassland ecosystems, lots of grasses, and there's a little bit more shrubbery in the back. By the time the first repeat is taken, the grassland is completely gone and it's been encroached. But interestingly enough, by the time they came back 30 years later in 1994 and took the second repeat, we can see that um, in the image that the area has actually gone back to its former grassland-like ecosystem. And that's actually because in the time span of the 30 years between the first and the second repeat, the area became under management, so it was managed by humans, and they pulled out the invasive species and watered the grasses, and ho and behold, we went back to uh, the grassland ecosystem. So that's a really, really interesting way to be able to see the effects of, uh, of a restoration treatment, for example, and to be able to document change uh, between all these different time periods. So one last uh, set of photo, one, one last set of photo here. So looking at a, at a mining community, so looking sort of more a little bit at the cultural aspect of, uh, of uh, these photos. So we're looking at a mining community in 1899 on the left. The first repeat on the top right, pretty much all the buildings are gone, but you can sort of still see the remain of the road and a little bit of buildings. But by the time the second repeat is done, pretty much all traces of you know, community life are gone. You can just see the road uh, just sort of in the middle left there. So another interesting way to look at uh, legacies that are left on the landscape, or in this case, that are being taken over by nature. So as I mentioned before, in terms of the way they analyze the change between um, the different images, so between their historical images and the subsequent repeats that they took. So they look at the percentage change in species covered from the original photographs to their first and second repeats. So they identified each species that they were seeing um, in their photographs, and then they basically assigned value, so positive value to um, species whose cover had increased, a negative value to species whose covers had decreased, and then zero if there was no change. And they basically looked at the percentage change. So they took all the species who had increased, subtracted the percentage change of species that had decreased, and then became null for the species that had not to be able to do this analysis of change between uh, their different sets of repeats, of repeats. And so each species was ID'd, as I had mentioned, and they ended up having 1,500 records from 72 different plant species. So that's a lot, a lot of work and a lot, a lot of details. Keep in mind, this was like 1960, so this is pretty advanced work for, um, for that period of time. Uh, before I move on to the second project, are there any questions about the changing mile? Uh, yes, uh, Jane Srivastava asked, uh, wondering what caused change in the first photo. Mm -hmm. The first was so arid, um, and was it used by first people before, or what mm -hmm. caused? It to get, grow so much more. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that specific area. So uh, in terms of, uh, you could see it was the, the people in the first historical image is the, what we see the horses are actually from the survey party. So it's not necessarily well known how well the area was used, but it does seem like it was um, traveled because of the, of the road. Um, and I think it also has to do with different changes in, in climate patterns, which they're also considering as a hypothesis for uh, the changes that they were observing. So there were lots of um, flash floods happening um, at that point in time. And so they're considering sort of these episodic climatic event as perhaps providing enough moisture to be able to sustain um, more of an encroachment of different plant species than a hundred and so years ago. So that was one of the hypotheses that um, they examined when, when thinking about the changes that they observed. 
I don't know if that fully answered your question, but <laughs> I don't have specific information about just that particular set of uh, a photo of that specific area. Just no, no, uh, I don't imagine there would be. A, I, I, I have a, a question. The, 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 um, when you were talking about uh, identifying uh, uh, location of photos using uh, virtual tours like, like, like Google Earth, uh, have you heard of the Bellingcat project? They, 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 they do uh, re research uh, to, 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 to help uh, oppress people who have uh, uh, you know, who have photos and, and, and to, to identify the location of photos or, or, or to, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the building. Yeah, I have actually. Uh, it was recently on The Current, <laughs> on CBC The Current. I think they did a, a portion on it where they were saying how um, they had, like the Bellingcat project had actually provided huge amounts of information for like the crisis happening in Syria. And so it wasn't necessarily just photographs, but they're also analyzing lots of video excerpts on YouTube and, and they're able to pinpoint just from all this analysis of all these different videos, um, sort of like uncovering the, the chemical plant that where like one of the explosions had happened. So it's really fascinating. I mean, it's just, so I know they have lots of researchers that are examining those um, videos and those photos, but they're also using uh, artificial intelligence in order to be able to pinpoint with keywords and, and different search terms to facilitate their research. So that's, yeah, that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. well, that's uh, it. Were you just saying, like, do you think they could be used to help us identify these locations? <laughs> Certainly, I mean, it'd be great if, they, <laughs> if they'd be willing to contribute. I think they're looking more on sort of the global scale. And for, I guess, for the scale of these projects, Google Earth, and we've got, sort of a few dedicated people that are really familiar with the landscape that help us to, to locate these images with the Mount Legacy project. Um, so I think for that scale, <laughs> it's definitely definitely more appropriate, but yes, very cool project. Are there any other questions? No. Okay, so I'll move on to the rephotographic survey project. So the rephotographic survey project uses repeat photography, but more on a sort of cultural and artistic um, outcome. And so the project creators were actually photographers. So Mark Klett, uh, who's a pretty well-known photographer in the Southwest United States, along with his associates, Helen Manchester and, and Joanne Berberg, they also came across uh, this collection of 19th century survey photos of the American West. And by staring at these images, they decided to create this pilot project where they would have the original historical photograph and the repeat, and they would create an exhibition and have people examine these photographs and comment and trying to understand, you know, the the views of the landscape that they were um, that they were viewing. And so originally they worked with 122 survey photographs that were repeated in three years, so from 1977 to 1979. But they also came back and did a second set of repeats uh, from 1997 to 19 uh, to 2000, and so that led, of course, to two books as well. So second view for the first uh, sets of repeats, and then third view for the the second one um, in 1997. And so what was interesting is that so when they had their first exhibition, so in in 1980, uh, and they had these side by side comparison. So not only did it provide um, a really detailed view of, of landscape change in the Western US. But for people who are viewing these images, they're actually able to grasp change in a much more meaningful way. Uh, and lots of people were commenting how having this side-by-side -side comparison actually allowed them to understand change. And so it was bringing forward sort of this impression of movement and change, which is often not associated with a photographer or with a photography. So when you Look at one image, especially if it's black and white, you know, you often think of something as being still and mobile, but having the side by side comparison between the historical image and the modern image, people were actually able to observe and understand the change that had occurred um, over the last 100 years. So it was it was definitely a different way to look at the landscape and, and understand what was going on. So I'm just going to show you a few images as well from this specific project. So this is the first image on the left is the original. It's so looking at Pyramid Lake in 1867. And 100 years later, you can see it's definitely not a lake anymore. Uh, so now it's a <laughs> Pyramid Island, but it's in a very desertic area. 
So again, huge, huge contrast uh, and change between the original and the historical um, and the repeated photo. Second photo, we're looking at another mining community. So you notice there's quite a few mining community. That's because it's the focus of my <laughs> research. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. But here in 1868, we have uh, the mining community. So you can see the town's pretty well developed. You can see parts of the mine. A hundred years later, uh, the town is pretty much all gone. And all that's left is the legacy of uh, the strip mining on the hillside. So that's a pretty powerful image. Again, that sort of shows the visual legacy um, and legacies of human activity without necessarily having um, any more humans on that landscape. And one final image from uh, this photo collection here that I like to show you. So this is uh, the Green River Canyon in 1872 on the left. And then 100 years later, it's actually a reservoir because a dam was built uh, in the meantime. So it completely flooded the area. So huge change. I mean, when you look at these images side by side, you can really grasp um, how powerful the change is and how much has changed in 100 years. Um, but if you were to look at these images individually, you wouldn't necessarily be able to grasp and understand that change um, as readily. And now we're at the Mountain Legacy Project. So <laughs> one more time, I'm just gonna ask if there's questions about the Rephotography Survey Project, and then I'll move to, to um, my own research in describing the Mountain Legacy Project. Uh, no, 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 nobody has uh, typed anything in the chat. Okay. That, yeah. Perfect, thank you, Denny. Um, so the Mountain Legacy Project, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, so it's the world's largest collection of historical and repeat photographs of mountain landscapes to study why and how these landscapes are changing. And so, so far we've acquired about 120,000 historical photographs. And over the last 22 years, we've repeated about 9,000 of them. So as you can see, there's lots of work left. <laughs> Probably that will go beyond my lifetime, but lots of work left. There's lots of photos left to, to be repeated. And we probably actually have more than 100,000, 120,000 historical photos. These are just the ones that we've identified and that uh, we know exist. So there might be many more potentially hiding in, in different archives um, that are related to this specific project. And just to give you a little overview of what you know this collection looks like and what we do. So uh, right now you're seeing a view of the historical image uh, taken in 1915 of Bull Creek Hills in Kananaskis. And this is uh, what the area looked like in 2017 when um, that image was repeated. So a lot of encroachment uh, by conifers. So you can see it on the right hand side. Uh, and this is kind of a major theme in a lot of the mountain legacy images that we see. So a lot of a lot of tree growth uh, over the last hundred so years. So you might be thinking, well, how do we come about acquiring this collection? Why, you know, why do we have it? Why does it exist? Well, similar to how to what I had mentioned uh, before. So uh, these photographs were taken for a specific purpose. So as Canada was growing as a country and expanding further and further west, um, there was a need to map the different areas so that rail and roadway and rail and roads could go through. And so Ottawa sent out a bunch of surveyors to make maps of the landscape uh, and do different measurements. And everything was going well. Manitoba, Saskatchewan, nice and flat, not a problem. You can use your traditional instruments. However, uh, suddenly they reached the Rocky Mountains and you couldn't just you know carry your chain up 10,000 feet of, uh, of elevation. So these surveyors had to develop a new method in order to be able to make these maps and calculate the different elevations of these mountain peaks and the different distances between them. And so they developed a technique called phototopographic mapping. And so what that involved is that they would go up these mountain peaks carrying their very heavy equipment along with uh, this glass plate camera. When they reached the top, they would take a 360 panorama view of the surrounding landscape. So they would take pictures in 360 degrees um, of what they were seeing and in the surrounding landscape. Then they would make a huge cairn. So this big pile of rocks on top of the summit. You would climb back down the mountain and then climb back up on one of the peaks that they had photographed. And they would sight back onto the cairn, take some measurements and then repeat the process all over again. 
And using this technique and basic trigonometry, they're able to calculate the different elevations of their mountain peaks, calculate different distances um, between the different peaks, and to really be able to make really, really accurate maps of um, the surrounding areas. So this is an example here of a map that was created in 1915 by Morrison Parsons Bridgeland, who's a um, pretty prolific surveyor at the time. And this is the area around uh, Waterton Lakes National Park. And what's amazing is that, you know, this map that was made over 100 years ago is actually pretty accurate and co comparable with mapping products that we see today. So really by using this phototopographic technique, they were able to produce pretty accurate maps uh, for the time and actually even for, um, for today. So it was a lot of work and a lot of exercise, but the product was of a very good quality. This is just to show you what the camera looked like. So this is the class plate camera that these surveyors would carry up these mountain peaks. Um, it was a dry glass plate camera. So what that meant is that they didn't need to develop these glass plates uh, while they were out doing their, their work in the mountains. So they can be stored and then brought back either to Calgary or to Ottawa and then be used for uh, map making later in the winter season when they weren't climbing peaks. So the camera itself with, um, with glass plates would be packed in a case and the case weighed about 30 to 40 pounds. So quite heavy. Uh, nowadays, we definitely have lighter equipment and we're very, very grateful for that. So we're not carrying uh, 30 pounds or 40 pounds of uh, camera equipment. So that's really great. <laughs> um, and right over here, we have um, sort of the first two pioneers of the Mountain Legacy Project. So on the right hand side, we have Eric Higgs, uh, who's the PI of the project. He's a professor at the University of Victoria. And on the left hand side, we have Janine Rumtula, who originally was his, one of his first master's students and is now also a professor in forestry at uh, UBC. And so I guess the story of the Mountain Legacy Project and the Mountain Legacy Collection sort of started with them and their discovery of uh, a set of historical photos in Jasper National Park. So they kind of stumbled upon this collection in 1997, uh, aided by a park warden at the time, and then decided, well, wouldn't it be neat to actually like repeat these photos and compare the change? And so they did that over three years. So they started in 1998, and I think they were done in 2001. And at the time they thought, well, maybe this is it, you know, maybe there's no more photos and this is the end of this project. But then um, again, a little bit <laughs> on the luck side, they got in touch with, um, park wardens from other parks who also happen to have, you know, different collections of historical photographs. And then they pretty soon realized that this collection was actually part of sort of the same survey project. And that led them to the National Archives in Ottawa and they realized that the collection was much, much greater than they had uh, originally anticipated. So as I mentioned before, you know, we're looking at up towards 120,000 uh, historical images uh, that are associated with this uh, map making process. And most of these images are housed at the Preservation Center uh, at Librarian Archives Canada in Gatineau, so right across from Ottawa. They're kept in boxes and temperature controlled vaults. Um, a lot of images, especially on the BC side, are actually at BC Archives. So that's in Victoria, right next to the Royal BC Museum. So a lot of what we've actually repeated and acquired so far come from Gatineau, but we still have lots of work to do on the BC side of archives and on the Yukon side as well. So lots and lots of work. <laughs> Could go on for many, many more decades. Um, you might be wondering how do we come about to actually acquiring these images and you know, using them for our research. So as I had mentioned before, sort of that first step into the, the basics of repeat photography. So you need to be able to acquire the, the image and be able to use it. Well, there's two ways that we do this. Uh, the first way, which is a little bit more of the slower way, uh, is that we request the image from Library and Archive Canada, and they actually have this very fancy and very expensive uh, digital scanner that will scan the plates for us and provide very, very high resolution uh, images from uh, these plates. And so once that's done, they send that back to us and we can use them for research. And that's great because the quality of these images are really spectacular, but it takes a lot of time in order to be able to do this process. And so if you want to use images for field work, we've actually developed another technique called the rapid appraisal. So what we do in the rapid appraisal is that a bunch of us, a bunch of researchers from University of Victoria, we will go to Ottawa, 
will request the plates uh, depending on different surveys that we're interested in. So we tend to know the areas in which the surveys are, but the fine pointing of the exact location happens later once we've actually have once we actually have copies of the plates. And what we do is that we actually take photos with our own digital camera of these plates. And these photos, um, they're not of as good as quality as the high resolution scans, but they're definitely good enough to allow us to go into the fields, so to allow us to go into the Rocky Mountains and start our repeat photography work. Once we're done with that, and if we're really interested in a particular set of images, then we can order the high resolution scans from Library and Archives Canada later, but at least we have done the field work and done the repeat, and then we can start with the analysis process. So talking about image localization, so the fun, the fun virtual Google Earth travel. So sometimes, like I said, so we'll, we'll tend to know the general areas that the surveyors were in. Sometimes there's uh, diaries that are associated with specific uh, collections, and that's very helpful because uh, some surveyors were very dedicated and they would write each day where they were, what mountain peak they would do. Uh, and that's fantastic because that helps us a lot to pinpoint the locations. Sometimes there's archival annotations on specific plates or envelopes, which helps us as well. But a lot of times, probably 80% of the time, if not more, there's not a lot of information um, on these plates. So we end up doing this virtual Google Earth traveling, which basically involves trying to match the peaks in the landscape that we see in our historical photographs with peaks uh, that we see in Google Earth. So it might sound really difficult and time consuming at first, and it is, but the more you do it, you kind of tend to become better at it. You also start to become familiar with the landscape and tend to identify different areas and, and peaks uh, a little bit faster. We're also fortunate, again, like I mentioned before, that we work uh, with a few people that are really, really good at this. Uh, one of these people, his name is Rob Watt, and he's a retired park warden from uh, Waterton. And he has an amazing and extensive knowledge um, of the Rocky Mountains and of this specific photo collection. He's been doing most of this image localization work for us. And I say, I have to say Rob's really accurate, like probably 95% of the time, he's able to pinpoint uh, the specific location. We also do a little bit of work when we're in the field. So we verify, make sure that all the images uh, make sense that they're showing the same view of the landscape uh, right before we're there. Because of course, it would be a lot of effort to climb on top of a mountain and then realize that you're in the wrong spot. It's happened a few times, but not many times. Um, so before we go to the field, so once we, we figure out where the images were taken, we do a little bit of image prep. So Normally, if we're using an image for research, we want to use the original image. So no enhancement, nothing, just whatever we get on the image is, is what we use. And we'll use the high resolution scans from Library and Archives Canada. But if we're using the um, rapid appraisal images, uh, we might want to be able to do a little bit of, of image modifications just to enhance our image so that we're able to take the best possible repeat while we're out in the field. So that involves using Lightroom and Photoshop to maybe remove some of the shadows, crop up a little bit of the highlights, center our image, so put a grid on our image so that will allow us to be able to center it when we're in the field. Basically just some small modifications that will allow us to get the best image and the best view so that when we're out in the field, we're not confused and you know not sure whether that's a peak or if it's a tree. So, just to get the best uh, possible image. But when we're doing research, we take uh, the original photograph with no enhancement whatsoever. Uh, the fun part, so yeah, so when we're done with our field prep, we know where our images were taken, then we actually get to go out and uh, repeat these images. So I've been pretty fortunate. I've been doing this for four years. I actually just came back from, from the fourth season of uh, field work with the Mountain Legacy Project about two weeks ago. Uh, most of the work is pre pretty physically demanding, so it involves hiking to these mountain peaks. They're often in remote areas, there's not a lot of trails, so it's a lot of work and we tend to only be able to go to one location per day. So that means one hike up, we do our repeats, and then we come back down. But for the last 10 years or so, we've also partnered with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. And we've been extremely fortunate because when they're not busy fighting fires, 
they actually allow us to use their helicopters. And so these helicopters will then drop us off on these different peaks. And instead of being able to just do one peak per day, we can do multiple peaks, three or four, sometimes even six or seven. I think the record was 14 in one day uh, with two different teams. So it, it really increases our productivity tremendously. And we're really grateful to be able to, to have this partnership that allows us to, to get our work done in a much more uh, faster, um, efficient and, and safe way. So yeah, it's, it's been really great to, to be able to have them along. I might be thinking, well, you know, you've gone to the field, you've taken your images, but you know, where do you actually do with these images and where can we see them? So we have a website and I've provided the link uh, at the end of this presentation. So the website is mountainlegacy.ca. And within that website, we have a platform called the Mountain Legacy Explorer. And it's basically the platform that stores all our images for us, all our image collection. And it's completely free and publicly available. So if you Google it after this presentation, um, you'll be able to, to access it as well. And so it works pretty, you know, in a very simple way. So on the left-hand side, you sort of have this uh, Google Maps embedded platform and you'll see red pins and uh, gray pins. And so the gray pins, if you'll click on a gray pin, uh, it'll show you a set of historical photos, but none of the repeats because the gray pins are areas where we've acquired the historical photographs, but we actually haven't been able to come back and repeat those images yet. If you click on a red pin, then it will show you the historical photographs on the top and then the repeated images um, at the bottom. So these are places where we've actually been and performed a repeat of uh, the historical images. You'll also get some information about the weather that day, a description of the route we took, basically as much information as possible that would actually allow somebody to come back if they're interested to repeat these photos again, maybe in 10, 20, 30 years. And it's actually happened with, uh, with two projects that we've gone back. So we've, uh, we've, we're doing sort of three beats and that's in Waterton and Jasper. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, in just a few minutes. But yes, yeah, completely publicly accessible. Um, so if you're interested to see what, you know, the historical landscape of the Rocky Mountains look like 100 to 120 years ago, I definitely invite you to, uh, to look this collection up. So what do we do with these images? So once we've acquired them, we've uploaded them onto our website, what does research with the Mountain Project, uh, with Mountain Legacy Project actually look like? Well, we've done research on uh, glacial change and glaciology, and uh, this is the very famous Athabasca Glacier. So huge change in terms of glacial retreat here that you can see in this image. We've also done our research on tree line advancement. So this is research that comes up from um, Andrew Trent, who's now a professor at the University of Waterloo. But when he was a postdoc with the Mount Legacy Project, he wanted to look at tree line advancement using this photo collection. And so what he did is that he mapped the extent of the historic uh, tree line and the historical image, and then mapped the uh, modern tree line in the modern image and basically compared uh, the two positions of the different tree lines. And so that led to a pretty interesting and um, well-received paper that was published last year, where uh, they basically, uh, Andrew Tran along with Eric Higgs and Brian Sosowski came up sort of with three main conclusions by analyzing these photographs. So not only had the tree line advanced in the Rocky Mountains, over the last hundred years, but there was also an increase in tree density that could be observed. And the uh, tree form of the major tree species had changed. So where previously historically, we were seeing these Krumpholz trees at high alpine um, elevations. So these Krumpholz are sort of these dwarfy like trees. Um, this was now replaced with mature trees on the same elevation. And so they came up with the, the different predictors that they analyzed and they came up with, uh, with the result that what predicted these, um, these results the most was latitude and altitude. So the further north you were and the further higher up you were on a mountain peak, the higher chance you had to observe these three main changes. So this change in tree form, uh, tree land advance and increased tree density. So that has huge implications in terms of forest management uh, particularly in mountain areas, uh, fire management, as we're you know increasingly um, becoming aware that we're part of a warmer and warmer world. So, really interesting paper that I uh, definitely invite you to uh, 
to read if, uh, if you have the chance. Other research that we're currently involved in, so there's another PhD student that's currently looking at changes in natural disturbance regimes. And he's using also a, a third repeat set of, of photos. So he's doing his research in Jasper National Park. The top uh, image that you see is the historical image from 1915. So this is looking at the Moline River Valley with the Jasper town site uh, behind. So you can see pretty barren, not a lot of vegetation. The middle image is the first set of repeat that, of the first set of uh, repeats that was performed in 1998 by Eric Higgs and Jenny Murtula. So huge increase in, in tree cover. You can see that the pretty much everywhere that was barren is now treed. And then we came back in 2019 and repeated that image uh, as well. And now what's interesting is that you're starting to see a lot of red in that landscape. And so every little red dot that you see is a tree that's been killed by a mountain pine beetle. So that's basically just dead fuel standing and waiting for a huge fire to come and uh, in through that landscape. And that's gonna have a huge implication for how, you know, for how fire patterns are moving through that landscape and for park management as well, who's looking into trying to manage, um, you know, these forests on a rapidly, um, in a rapidly changing landscape. So that's one project that's being undertaken with sort of these third sets of repeats. Another project is in uh, Waterton Lake La National Park. So looking at uh, changes in regeneration after fire. So um, here in the first set of image, we have the original image that was taken in 1914 and it's classified version. Um, so that's how we have a specific software program that I'm gonna show you that allows us to classify the different features that we see um, onto our images. And then we're able to calculate a different percentage of these different land cover types. So this is in 1914. So you can see there's quite a bit of coniferous forest. In 2004, when this image was first repeated, so a little bit more of coniferous forest, but not that much more. Um, there's a little bit less herbaceous. What becomes really interesting is then the Kino fire happened in 2017. And so you can see the, the huge burn area um, that was left on the landscape. And so we came in 2019 and repeated this image again. And so all the, all the red on that image which is called regenerating area is basically the, the area that was burned uh, after the fire. And so the park is currently uh, implementing a monitoring plan and using, planning to use these images to do some monitoring uh, of the effects of the Kino fire and see what's regenerating on, uh, on the landscape and comparing it with the previous sets of photographs. So super useful tool to be able to have this to document the changes, especially after a major event um, like that Kino fire. And finally, moving on with my research, I'm just going to take a little bit of water. So I'm interested in understanding the cultural and ecological changes that are occurring on landscapes that have been mined. And for example, if we look at this image, so this is an image that uh, was taken in 1921. It's an image of Mount Park um, that was uh, a small mining community. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century. So all these mining communities were sort of starting to pop up uh, all over the Rocky Mountains because uh, it's very rich in, in coal deposits, especially in the, the Eastern slopes. And so they were using underground mining methods in order to be able to mine the coal to support um, the railway industry. However, with the advent of the discovery of oil in 1947 and uh, the advent of the diesel engine, coal started to be obsolete. And so these towns were sort of progressively, you know, slowly and slowly people left them um, and moved out to areas that were more prosperous. However, the memory of these towns on the, the landscape still remain. In the 1990s and 2000, the demand for coal, specifically metallurgical coal, rose. And so there was a push to have these areas to be remined. However, the methods for mining that areas, those areas had changed. And so what started off as a sort of small scale underground operation turned into these huge open pit um, mining operations. And so you have you know, a landscape starting off looking like this to one looking like, like this. And so this is the repeat image that we took in 2018 of that same area. And this is the town of, of what, what's left of the town of Mount Park. So it's pretty much uh, just the cemetery. Now you can obviously see, I mean, there's 
huge ecological changes and implications in terms of landscape fragmentation and, and connectivity between these different patches of landscape. Uh, but I'm, what I'm also interested to learn is the cultural effect of, um, of these changes on the people who used to live on that landscape and trying to understand the effect of, um, of having an activity like this on landscape memory and people's attachment and sense of place and what, um, and what effect that has on the value that people place on landscapes. So that's, uh, that's what I'm investigating using the, the photo collection. And I'll also be doing some participatory mapping uh, exercises with community members in these uh, different areas. So stay tuned. <laughs> I still have a little bit, I'm only halfway through my, my research, so still got a little bit of, uh, of work left to do uh, on that. Uh, so the interesting part, well, hopefully all of it has been interesting, but uh, perhaps something more applicable um, for you if you have uh, photos that you'd like to analyze, if you have repeat photos that you'd like to analyze. So we're pretty lucky at the Mountain Legacy Project. We've had a piece of software that was developed specifically for this project, and it's called the Image Analysis Toolkit. And this is also uh, freely available online. Um, I have a link for it um, at the end that you can also use. And you can basically upload your own images and do various analysis um, on them. I'm actually going to show you what it looks like. So I think I have to reshare my screen. So I've gone back and then there we go. Okay, so you should be able to see it now. So this is what our, our IAT image analysis toolkit looks like. These are just the, the basic photos that uh, come up, but you can load your own images. Uh, so you can just drag and drop into here and into here, um, whichever images you'd like to analyze. So we have different features um, that this tool allows us to, to use. So the really useful one is the align feature. And so the way that we do this is that we have different control points. So we set up control points on our historical image and then match them up onto our modern image and so on and so forth. Obviously these are really, the points are one next to each other because the images have already been aligned. So in a, in a normal situation, you would have to find each peak on each image and, and try to match them. Um, you usually need a minimum of four control points in order to be able to do uh, the alignment between uh, the two pictures. We also have something called a viewer, which is pretty neat, uh, also called the window through time. So if you, you can just do a little area here. So that basically allows us to, to kind of have a little kind of like a little view of what the historical image uh, looked like embedded into the modern and, and so on. So that's pretty neat. Um, and then we also have the sweep tool. So that just allows us to, first of all, look at our alignment, but also have kind of a more precise side-by-side -side comparison. So you can leave your image like this. Um, so just very different image uh, visualization and image manipulation tools. And um, we also have the, the different categorization tools, uh, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. I just have to Go back to my presentation. So here we go again and back over here. So uh, the image analysis toolkit also allows us to classify our different images. And so what do you see here? So on the top left image, we, uh, we have our historical image that has been classified on the right. And then on the bottom is the modern image, which has been classified on the right as well. And so just by looking at the two images from top to bottom that have been classified, you're probably wondering, well, what's that huge patch of green, <laughs> dark green um, on the modern one? Well, that's actually dense coniferous forest. And the image analysis toolkit actually allows us to, to be able to quantify this change. And so if we look at the quantification of that specific category, so in 1913, dense coniferous forest occupied 11% of the landscape. But in 2017, it occupied 40% of the landscape. So that means that in the 100 years or so since the uh, historical, since the repeat was, was taken, there is a 30% increase in dense coniferous forests, which is huge to have that much increase um, in, in 100 so years. So again, huge implications for, for forest management and um, fire management in, in the Rocky Mountains. So what's next for the Mountain Legacy Project? So where, where are we working? Uh, what are we working on now? So we're actually trying to incorporate more data products into our research. 
So I had mentioned originally, you know, talking about different aerial photographs and satellite imagery. So we're actually trying to combine um, both the repeat photography images and um, the aerial photography into one digital product. And so what that involves is that it actually involves flattening our images, so incorporating them into a uh, geographical information system program. And that involves acquiring, you know, different products, so different digital elevation models for the specific areas that we're uh, using. Uh, it involves working with different algorithms and different programs in order to be able to incorporate our oblique image and flatten it on top of, um, of these different products. But we've been uh, pretty successful so far. So there's been some trials on Southern Alberta and in Jasper where we've actually been able to do that. And what that allows us to do is that we're actually able, we're actually able to get then different uh, timestamps onto our uh, comparison of images. So we would have our original historical image taken 100 so years ago. We would have the modern image taken, you know, 2000 something. And then we'd be able to fill in the time gaps with the different, um, different products. And we'd also be able to go from uh, looking at comparisons using just a specific pixel size percentage. So here, for example, these, um, these comparisons with so these percentages percentages and change reflect changes in pixels. So pixels from these images. But when we incorporate these images onto a uh, GIS program, we can actually get changes in specific area measurements. So we're not talking just about pixel changes, but we're actually talking about changes in specific areas. So how many square kilometers, for example, of dense coniferous forest has changed between the historical and the mono repeat. So perhaps a little bit more manageable numbers that are more useful for uh, park management, for example, or uh, different stakeholders that are interested in using these products in order to be able to make decisions um, about these landscapes. So some useful research uh, resources, if you're interested in learning more um, about repeat photography and about the different projects that I've talked about. So Mapper of Mountains is a great resource if you're interested to learn more about the surveyors, um, the history behind the survey project, and the Mountain Legacy Project. Uh, the Methods and Application Repeat Photography is a really good tool that talks about sort of the history of repeat photography and different applications. And then I've got uh, the books on um, second and third view for the Rephotographic Project, The Changing Mile, and Jay Sherwood's book, uh, Surveying the Great Divide, that provides a really good story about um, the survey that was done between Alberta and BC uh, between 1913 and 1917. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for, for listening again. So we've got the links at the bottom. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them. And also feel free if, uh, if you have specific questions afterwards. I think I shared my email with, um, with Annie and Laura, but please feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions you have either about the Man Legacy Project or repeat photography.